everybody. Welcome to Ask the Pastor. I feel like it's like a game show sometimes. You know, I feel like we should have multiple <laughs> pastors that we ask, rate their, their right. answers. I don't know. Pastor behind door number three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which pastor I'll... do you want to ask today, you know? I think right. that maybe maybe we'll switch it. That'll be 3.0 version of the podcast is, is more of a game <laughs> show format. But uh, I'm here with Pastor J.D. Greer. I'm Matt Love. Um, and we have a, a question today um, that's actually from a member of the Summit Church uh, at our Chapel Hill campus um, who asked a great evangelism question. Um, and she, uh, I, I don't know if it's a him or her, but they asked, um, how do you share the gospel with a staunch atheist, which is a great, great topic for a podcast. I mean, I feel like yeah. it's the ultimate evangelism question, right? I'm talking to someone who isn't just apathetic, who isn't like, I grew up in church, but I just don't go anymore, but actually is aggressively saying God does not exist. I do not believe this at all. You are absolutely wrong. How do you share the gospel with someone like that? Well, the title of this podcast is Ask the Pastor, not Ask the Philosopher. Um, no. And so, you know, there's a couple ways you could do this. You could actually say, well, here are the best arguments against atheism. And, and that maybe maybe that will make for a, a different podcast at a different time. But I want to answer this the way that I would answer it to somebody if they catch me after church. Yeah. And they just say, because this happens all the time, you know, they say, hey, they'll tell me about somebody and they'll say, what? what are the best practices for my atheist friend? And without getting into the particulars of this person's atheism, because almost always, you know, what the mind believes is not necessarily the result of careful, logical deduction. It's, you know, I remember reading that the, you know, the the six or seven most famous atheists of the last hundred years, you know, from Nietzsche to Madeleine Murray O'Hare to, uh, you know, um, uh, Albert Camus and, 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 and a lot of those guys, they all of them had like, destroyed relationships with their fathers. And so, mm. um, you know, the, you got a lot of factors going into that and realizing that. So in not knowing the person, I always just say there's, there's, there's a handful of things that you should remember. One is um, our value here at the Summit Church, we say pray first, second, and third. Mm. And it just means that at the end of the day, um, you know, to quote Ian Bounds, I should never talk to men about God more than I talk to God about those men. And I'm just praying that God would open their heart, that God, I, I want to join God in what he's doing in that atheist life. I will tell you um, firsthand that the best way to get discouraged in any type of evangelism project is to feel like you're the one that's doing it and you're asking God to help you. Um, really, the way that you sustain state, you know, the way that you, you do this is you realize salvation belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to spend a lot of time talking to God about them and asking him to create the situations and create the questions and put the words in my, in my mouth. And then the second thing I try to tell people is to be careful about overwhelming your atheist <laughs> friend, yeah. you know, yeah. where this is all you ever talk about. Yes. You know, uh, uh, so I feel like you're smiling as if like you're thinking about a situation that you've messed up on this. No, no, it just it's I think it's it's almost uh, well, y y J.D., you know me well enough to know I, I see things when someone starts pushing back. I'm like, I see it as a challenge. And so I, I kind of sometimes can get caught in that. Like, no, we're going to do this. Let's talk like let's keep going. Right. Like, let's stay on it. But uh, to your point, so I'm laughing. Yes, because I feel like this is this is something I have to remember. <laughs> Um, well, something that, you, you and I have in common, but you, because I'm I'm very much like if you're not convinced, I just haven't said it right yet. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> you know? yes. And so I'm going to keep doing it. And, and, and it's one of the biggest things I've had to learn, whether I'm thinking about parenting or evangelism, is that ultimately these things, God has to grow them. And so, yeah, I mean, I get into argumentation. I'm not saying you just, you know, are passive in it. I'll, I'll, I'll press the argument, but I realize there's a point at which I don't want to overwhelm somebody. I, I plant the seed. I give the reasons, but I'm not trying to, you know, these 3 a.m. arguments or vicious, you know, uh, yeah. uh, social media. That, that, that's not going to be the way that God brings fruit. His word brings fruit. So don't, you know, don't, 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 don't make it where your friend, it's kind of like I think about with my teenage kids. I don't want my teenage kids to think every time my dad and me get together, he wants to talk about the five or six things that he thinks are wrong in my life. Yeah. You know, the same thing. You, you want to have a relationship with that atheist friend that's deeper and better than just this one subject. So, you know, don't overwhelm them. Give God time to do the work. Um, pray for opportunities, um, not just to share, but I would say even more to show extraordinary grace. Um, Act 16, I think, is one of the best little, you know, pictures of how different kinds of people um, get saved and how, or how, or how God works differently in the lives of different kinds of people. You got the apostle Paul going into a, a very Gentile city 
and he, he immediately, um, you know, three people, he basically leads to Christ. One of them is, is, um, you know, Lydia, I think of Lydia as like a, a seeker. She wanted to, and she just asked good questions and yeah. she basically came to one of Paul's Bible studies, a letter to Christ. Then you had a servant girl who's basically an oppressed, you know, and Paul gets involved in her life by, you know, mercy work and by acts of deliverance. But then you have the Philippian jailer and he represents kind of the, the educated aristocracy. I mean, I know he, you know, as a jailer, he's you know, not a philosopher, but he was part of the the ruling class. And the way that he comes to Christ is he sees Paul's generosity toward the servant girl, and he sees Paul's um, patience and joy in the midst of persecution and pain. You know, it's when he sees Paul singing at midnight after he's been unjustly beaten, and he sees the walls fall down in the prison, and Paul refused to leave even when he could so that he could come back for the jailer. You know, yeah. that's when he falls to his knees and said, what must I do to be saved? It's It may not be your, your, your incredible argument that finally convinces your atheist friend. It may be um, the joy and the peace that you have in suffering or the generosity you show to people who, who don't deserve it. Um, yeah. So pray for those opportunities. Um, you know, my, my next piece of counsel is always invite them when you can yeah. to read the Bible. Yes, do apologetic. Yeah, get into the weeds on the apologetics. I have a, a person who came to Christ a couple of years ago, and that's because we went through a lot of the apologetic arguments. So I'm not against that. But just just get them under the teaching and the reading of of, of God's word. Hebrews four twelve says God's word is quick and alive and it pierces down to the to to, to the soul and to the spirit. Um you know, I always think of what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, um, you know, the, the Bible in some ways is like a caged lion. If somebody is attacking the lion, you don't, you know, stand beside the cage and defend the lion. You just unlock the cage, let the lion out. So if you can get somebody reading the Bible with you, you can get somebody, um, you know, coming to church with you. That's what happened to my, um, you know, friend that I'm I'm talking about is that they just started coming to church. And so while we're having these apologetic discussions, they're just under the normal teaching and preaching of the word of God. And that's, it's just bringing life and making them come alive. Um, after you've had a couple of these really, you know, kind of in-depth conversations, um, at, at some point you're, you're just going to have to shift to, to answering questions, you know, where you're going to first Peter three fifteen be ready to give a, a reason for the hope that's in you. That's all a delicate balance that you have to, you just have to learn. You have to learn and let the Holy Spirit guide you in it. There's no one right formula. It's walking with the Holy Spirit as he brings them to Christ and as he uses you in the process. So, yeah, in just a, in just a second, I, I want to ask a little bit of just kind of some of the practical things you do use to kind of think through the apologetics element of this conversation. Um, so we'll come back to that. But I, I do just love that framing because I think in any evangelism conversation, it is so much about the relationship you're building um, with the person and creating opportunities for God in his power through his word, through prayer, through his spirit to do the work. And, you know, again, just going back to what I was saying about myself earlier, I tend to believe too much in my ability to make an argument over the the word of God's ability to just pierce somebody's heart, like you said. Um, and so I think just starting there is so helpful and freeing because when we're moving into the apologetics piece, um, we're doing it out of this kind of sense of, man, we're, we're leaning into God, we're trusting him, we're putting them in front of, in front of God and his word. So love that framing. But as we're building that relationship, as we're hopefully praying consistently for this person, bringing them to the word, maybe bringing them to church, how do you navigate some of the apologetics conversations uh, that you have with people? So after me telling you, I'm not really not going to do that as podcast. You're going to end this podcast by saying, well, why don't you just do that real quick? That's what I, 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 I represent the people, JD. All right. And that's what the people want. All right. I can, I can sense it. So, all right. I'll give the people what they want. Um, you know, I, I, my youth pastor, when I was 16 or 17 years old, I remember him saying, I've been asked lots of questions about Christianity. I didn't know how to answer, but I've never been asked the same question that I couldn't answer twice. He would always use that question to go back and, and figure it out. And so I do think it's, it's why to be prepared. Um, I don't know if I've lived up to that, to my youth pastor standard, because there have been a couple times I've been, I mean, like, I still don't know a good answer to that question. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I've, I've uh, gleaned, and in, in, in specifically with atheists, how to approach this, comes from a, um, an old Christian apologist named Francis Schaeffer. I uh, wrote a book, um, wrote several books just about engaging with people like this. And one of them, um, it, it, one of them, he talks about, he, he calls it taking the roof off of the worldview of your 
the person you're talking to. Everybody's got a worldview. And he says a lot of worldviews just ultimately don't make a lot of sense. Like um, they have un, unquestioned assumptions. They People have never really thought about well, what happens then and, and, and what's next and, and how does that comfort you in death and what happens when when you, you, you're not able to overcome life's obstacles and, and or what does that mean for all the people that, you know, that are in poverty or they you, you, it's just all kinds of questions that that really begin to make people, you know, kind of say, yeah, I, I don't know if my worldview is well. Most people don't walk around with well thought out worldviews. It's just something they very practically develop. So he, he just says, ask questions. Why questions and where's that leading and why and um, tell me about your assumption there. And, and if this sounds kind of overwhelming to you, like, I don't know how to do this. Um, I, I'm going to recommend a couple of sources that have been really helpful in, in, in helping me kind of come up with what those questions are. But the, the approach is just called taking the roof off. Um, Randy Newman is a guy, not the actor guy, but um, a Christian apologist guy. He wrote a book called Questioning Evangelism. It's been out for, I think, a couple decades and he, he basically he just goes through a series of questions that you could ask. And I go back to that book again and again. He even models it after how Jesus does it. Jesus was big on this, just asking people questions that would guide them um, at least close to where they need to be so that when he then gave, you know, kind of a statement answer, it, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, you know, one of the one of the very best questions we can ask people in conversations, <laughs> Newman writes, remember, is just the question, Really? Yeah. Oh, that was that was the one I remember most from the book. Really, you know, it's kind of like, do do you really believe that we came from nothing, and yet yeah. life is so meticulously, miraculously held together? Do you really believe that nothing happens when we die? That 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 nothing times nobody equals everything. Do you really believe that? Yeah. Another great book that's going to have a, a similar kind of approach is, is, is a newer one. I just came out last year by a guy named Gavin Ortland uh, called Why God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't. And he, he basically says, everybody's got these stories, origin stories, stories that give us meaning and conflict, stories that give us hope. He said the constant question that that you have to be asking is which story, which one tells the best story? Mm. Which which one is the story that count, accounts for the strangeness, the incompleteness, the brokenness, and the beauty of our world? He said, I don't – he goes, if you ask atheists a lot of questions, their story does not account for those things. The, 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 the brokenness, the beauty, the longing for meaning. He says they have a story. And he says, just ask a lot of questions that try to show why the story that they embrace doesn't really – account for um, all the the mysteries and the beauty and the realities of life. In fact, one of the things I remember from that book that really stood out is he he was quoting um, an older Christian apologist friend of his who had spent, I think, some 30 years um, on university campuses just talking to intellectual students about Christianity. He said 30 years ago, the primary question was, um, you know, about Christianity's truth. Does God exist? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Is the Bible reliable? He said today, those questions are not irrelevant, but today he has asked more questions about Christianity's goodness. Is the church intolerant? Has it been the source of injustice or Christians homophobic? And he said, so when you're presenting somebody, yes, deal with the truth aspects, but sometimes what you're, you're dealing with is why Christianity puts forward the best view of the dignity of men and women and, and justice for all people and the best the best foundation for a lot of the a lot of the the most cherished virtues and values that we hold dear today. And uh, that's a powerful way, you know, to engage in this apologetic with a with a staunch atheist friend. Love it. And just again, uh, I love any of these questions where people are asking a question because they're in a they're in a relationship. They want to see God do something, mm -hmm. and that's amazing. And so um praying for those conversations and any evangelistic conversations that people that are listening are having, because they're they're challenging, but um they're hard to navigate at times. But it's amazing when you get to be sitting with someone in that moment where God is really turning their heart um and and bringing them to him. So love that people are processing through that. And I think my takeaway is read the Randy Newman book to learn what questions to ask and then listen to the Randy Newman Toy Story soundtrack while I'm reading uh, to just get myself in the right mind space. So both Randy Newman's at play here. Um, and next week, JD, we will have a question about modesty and whether modesty matters or is it even biblical? We've just been making this up the whole time. How does modesty fit into a Christian worldview? So come back and listen to that next week. Um, go ahead and subscribe right now. Just take a second. Do it. Hit the button if you haven't done it already. I'm going to keep saying this after every podcast too. 
So I know people are like plus 15 seconds in me right now, but just do it. Subscribe. And if you all subscribe, <laughs> I won't have to keep saying it. Um, and then also, please go on YouTube, watch us. Like, we're, we're doing a lot. I bought all these books behind me just to have books behind me for this YouTube thing, all right? So it was extraordinarily expensive. Please go watch on YouTube. You can subscribe at j.d.greer and watch us on YouTube. And we'll see you next week on Ask the Pastor. Ask the Pastor.